So, he re Father Benninger resides in Snowmass, Colorado with his fellow Trappist monks at St. Benedict's Monastery. A few times each year, he ventures out to share his wisdom and love, primarily about the spiritual journey from contemplative perspectives. He's written over 15 books, he's done graduate studies at Harvard Divinity School, and he contributes to the Benedictine way of work and prayer, ora e labora, by personally making flower cards and bookmarks, and some are in the back with Dan Dobbins back there, so you can pick them up later on uh, at the end of his talk. Um, he's a recipient of many awards on his writings in the contemplative way. Um, in October of 2015, Father Manager was here and he gave two workshops. One was on centering prayer, and the other was on uh, one of his favorite topics, Julian of Norwich, which is one of his 15 books. And, uh, and it was a fantastic occasion. And when I asked Father Menninger uh, of all the topics that he can speak on, and I was with him in Richmond Hills, a retreat center in Richmond, Virginia, in October for a three-day uh, teaching that he had on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so he has many topics. I'm just using that as an example to show you how wide his breadth of reaching across the contemplative perspective is. And so that's to prepare you for your questions later on, because you can go anywhere with him. He's ready. Okay, so when I asked him, I said, what, what would you let, you know our community, you've been here before, what do you want to speak on? So here's his answer back. See how pithy it is. He says, definitely I would suggest the book of privy counseling as a way of moving forward in the spiritual journey and the contemplative prayer practice. May you be happy. May you be free. May you be loving. May you be loved. Father William Menninger. So tonight he's going to speak on the book of privy counseling. And he's best known for reintroducing this ancient Christian meditative practice to today's Christian seeker. It's been labeled centering prayer. And it's prayed here at St. John Neumann every Thursday night. And every other Thursday morning, it, uh, we have it here, and it's done all over the world. And it basically sprang from his discovery of what everybody always calls a dusty little book. But what he told me at dinner is that's why we have novices in the monastery. There's no dust in the monastery. So it wasn't a dusty book. But he had taught, he had taught Middle English, so he's attracted to people like Geoffrey Chaucer. And so when he saw this book that was written in Middle English, he was attracted to it as a teacher of that tongue. And then he discovered, when he began to translate it, what it was about. And it was a way that person back in the 14th century was trying to share with others how to experience God through this direct union of an experience of God. And it was written not in Latin, which if you had paper and parchment, precious tools in those days, you wrote in Latin for the intelligentsia. It was written in Middle English specifically for reaching the everyday person. You know, it was very egalitarian way back then. So he discovered this book at, in Spencer, Massachusetts in 1974 at St. Joseph's Abbey. Am I a minute? <laughs> <laughs> it, the book is called The Cloud of the Unknowing. And, 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 and uh, the, the last part of it is called the Book of Privy Counseling. And so uh, with that, Father Manager, we're honored to have you here tonight. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? I, I don't have the microphone on. But uh, can, can everybody hear me? Of course, those who can't hear me can't hear me. <laughs> uh, if you cannot hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> But uh, if you can't, don't come down front. There's lots of room down front if you, if you need it. And please don't sit in the back, you know, not hearing what I have to say. Uh, whenever you find an edition of The Cloud of Unknowing, a, a modern translation, and there's seven or eight of them, uh, you'll always find appended with it the second little book or treatise called the Book of Privy Counseling. And uh, the, uh, uh, I haven't, last, it was a few months ago in Tallahassee, I gave a weekend retreat 
on the Book of Privy Counseling. It's the first time I've done anything on it. I've given literally thousands of workshops and retreats on the cloud of unknowing since 1974. But, you know, uh, uh, reflecting on it, I, uh, I realized that, you know, there are, I, I always teach the cloud of unknowing as though I'm teaching beginners how to do contemplative prayer, how to do centering prayer. Uh, and I'm an, I, I, I can do it with my eyes closed and standing on my head. Uh, and, but it, it just, it, it hasn't occurred to me, uh, as it should have, that now I've been doing this since 1974. Father Thomas Keating has been doing it since 1976. Uh, others have been doing it, you know, since then. And uh, that people have been doing it now for 20, 30, and 40 years. And uh, it's high time we recognize that. That, that people aren't all, everybody is not a beginner. And that's the whole purpose of the Book of Privy Counseling. It's written for uh, uh, those who are not beginners. The cloud, he says he's writing for three classes of people. He's writing for beginners, then he's writing for what he calls proficients, those a little advanced, and then he's writing for the perfect. Don't, don't take that too literally. <laughs> Uh, th those who are, you know, really advanced in the practice of contemplative prayer. So it seemed to me that it was high time we, uh, we I started doing more uh, for people now who have been involved in the practice of centering prayer for some time. And I, I don't limit it to centering prayer either. This could be people who are involved in, 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 in transcendental meditation, people who are involved in mindfulness, uh, people who are involved in the meditation taught in, by the, uh, in the Ignatian spiritual exercises, the fourth week uh, of contemplative prayer using the Our Father, uh, any form. There are many, many forms of contemplation. I focus, of course, on centering as the easiest way, I think, to teach and a way that some people can be very receptive of. But uh, many people now have been doing uh, contemplative meditation type prayer for, you know, for decades. And that's what the Book of Privy Counseling, that is for whom the Book of Privy Counseling was written, okay? So, the, uh, it was written 20 years after the Cloud of Unknowing. And so it represents the author's uh, personal experience of growth in contemplative prayer and in teaching it. Um, in the cloud of unknowing, uh, the unknown author asks for feedback. Oh, don't ever ask for feedback unless you really want it, because <laughs> you're going to get it. Uh, but he does, he, in several places, he says, well, now look, I'm not the last word. This is what my experience is and what I've been teaching. And he says, you may have a better way. And then he says, if you have, let me know. Okay? Now, and, and, and that has to be said even today. Uh, I'm not speaking the last word of anything. That, that, that you may know, or you may have a better word, way. Yeah, you may find a better way. Let us know if you do. So uh, it seems that he got this feedback and uh, he actually collected it for 20 years after he finished the cloud. And then he wrote the book of privy counseling. It just means private direction. <clears throat> and so uh, taking into account all of the phone calls, this is 14th century, the letters, the emails and the faxes that he received. He had a, a desk full of them, you see, after 20 years. And uh, uh, decided then that, well, it was time for him to write the sequel to The Cloud of Unknowing. Now, uh, as is customary at the time, in the middle of the 1300s, uh, in the foreword to his book, he states just who he thinks should read this book. Uh, actually, who 
he was writing for. Ostensibly, he was writing for the cloud of unknowing for a novice, okay? Uh, but clearly now, 20 years later, he's no longer a novice. Uh, but as we see that that's just a literary device, that he's actually uh, writing for all who are engaged or wish to be engaged in this love of God that he calls uh, contemplative prayer. So uh, he addresses it uh, to my dear friend in God. Now, but then he does go on to say, it's kind of a warning, that he's not writing for the general public. Um, you see this, by the way, John of the Cross, who addressed the, the same topic, the same subject, uh, wrote 200 years later, and in John of the Cross is what you might call his advanced work, the living flame of love, for example, uh, he's very, very careful to state, he, he says, there are very few people who reach this stage. Well, now that may have been true in 16th century Spain. It is not true in 21st century America. Uh, there are many people who reach this stage and many of them are here. So um, the, um, he's, he says, that the author of The Cloud, that he's going to speak only about things that he feels are most helpful to his friend, presumably the same monk for whom he wrote The Cloud of Unknowing at this time. So 20 years later, after 20 years of uh, you know practical experience. So um, now the cloud, as I mentioned, it does include three stages in the journey towards God, uh, beginners, the uh, uh, proficient and the perfect. Privy counseling, is written primarily for the perfect. Don't be afraid of the word and don't be misled by the word. Just as I, was, as I would urge you not to be afraid or misled of the word mystic. You are all mystics. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Uh, a mystic isn't somebody who has visions or elevations or, or tells the future. A mystic is simply one, and I use the description actually given by a wonderful uh, uh, Episcopalian mystic, Evelyn Underhill, uh, early 20th century. And uh, Evelyn Underhill, her definition, it isn't original with her, but she summed it up. Her definition of a mystic is anyone who seeks a blessed union with God immediately without intermediaries. And that's what you do in centering prayer. You're not looking for intermediaries between you and God. You want this direct love, heart to heart, face to face, between yourself and God. That's what makes you a mystic, okay? And, and uh, the mystics themselves deplored uh, this uh, overdone, romantic, uh, fanciful, unrealistic concept of a mystic as, you know, being a visionary and somebody who does miracles and so forth. They, they really even despised all of that stuff as, you know, kind of like a three-ring circus. Uh, that, that's not what they are talking about. So uh, um, at the end of the preface to this little book, the Book of Privy Counseling, the anonymous author says he's addressing, and take this to heart now, he's addressing this book to you and others like you, okay? So, in chapter one, he starts, by the way, the Cloud of Unknowing has um, 20, uh, 75 chapters. The Book of Privy Counseling, I think, has 23. So it's considerably shorter. And the chapters are, you know, at the most a page, page and a half, sometimes just one, one small paragraph. So in chapter one, he starts by saying, when you go apart, to be alone for prayer. Um, he is assuming that the contemplative experience is done in a solitary fashion. Not, for example, in the monastic choir, you know, in the, uh, as the monks are assembled for church uh, when they sing the divine office. 
Um, however, we do want to be aware of the custom and the laudable practice of sharing our contemplative prayer um, in a group. Um, the, the, uh, as, for example, contemplative outreach, as they do uh, twice a week in this parish here. Uh, groups meet together. But they do it, what they're coming is they're sharing something that they do by themselves every day, you see, during the week. Um, and, and the uh, Richard Rohr, uh, who is a very strong advocate of centering prayer, um, in a, he, uh, he mentions three Buddhist requirements. Uh, the practice, the teaching, uh, and the spiritual director, uh, you know, for, uh, for any kind of prayer or meditation. So uh, the, uh, and the, the, we have the, the, the church, the parish, the centering prayer group, which is, you know, very, very common today uh, uh, among practitioners of contemplative meditation. So when you, he says in the cloud, uh, in the book of Privy Counseling, uh, when you go to do your contemplative prayer, and he refers to it, by the way, sometimes as contemplative prayer, but most often as the work of love. I love it, and I love that. Uh, it's the work of love. This is what it is. It's not only what it is, it's how you do it. So uh, when you go to do your contemplative prayer, put aside everything that you are doing and that you are going to do, all thoughts and words. So not, not only, you know, stop the activity with your hands and your feet, but stop the activity with your head. And that is crucial. So uh, he says, have nothing in your mind but a naked intent reaching, stretching out towards God. I love that because that is an accurate description of contemplative prayer. A naked intent stretching out towards God. That's what you do in your centering prayer. It's naked because there's nothing else. There's no, you, you try not, you, you bury, as he says, everything beneath the cloud of forgetting and you stretch it and reach out toward the cloud of unknowing. Where alone in this life you will find God. So, um, the, and that's a quote actually from chapter three of the cloud when he is ta say, talking to people how you should do centering prayer, talking to beginners. And that's a phrase that he uses. He says, contemplation is a naked intent stretching out towards God. So he says, keep only the simple awareness that God is. Nothing, you know, God is, God is good, God is powerful, God is just, God is in heaven, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, no, none of that, none of that, none of that. Simply that God is. That's what makes it a naked intent. And, and that's what we try to do. And, and by the way, the word try is very important. I, I have to constantly keep referring back to the cloud of unknowing because, well, after all, uh, you know, the Book of Privy Counseling comes from that. Uh, and he says, you know, yes, well, in contemplative prayer, you love God. It's as simple as that. And it says, yeah, you know, people do what I call the yabbits. You know, they stroke their beard and they go, yeah, but, you know, the yabbits. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, I find it so hard to love God. So he says, okay, that's all right. Find it hard to love God. Try to love God. And then somebody else still says, yeah, but I don't know if I can try. Then he says, okay, you can't love God. You can't try to love God. Pretend to try to love <laughs> God. And that will be sufficient. Because you see, that's an intention. That's an intent. That's an intent. And what is this prayer? It's, the, it's, it's, it's a naked intent towards God. See, So it's, it's quite legitimate. If, even if you just pretend to try to love God.
all right? So, um, so this is what he says. Keep only the simple awareness that God is as he is. Your mind should be empty, but anchored in faith. Well, what does that mean, anchored in faith? Well, y- your mind is empty, but you're trusting, you're, you, you, you have confidence in God. So again, it's part of your, of your awareness, right? So your mind should be empty, but can you make your mind empty? Well, this is some, the, the whole problem. This is the issue, well, how do you do that? How do you empty your mind, you know? One of the things, though, that helps us, by the way, we have to realize that we are not our minds. We are not our minds. You are not a conglomeration of the things that go on in your head. That's not who you are. You are not your thoughts. You are not your memories. You are not your imaginations. You are not your decisions. These are things that you do. They are not who you are. Uh, This is very, very important in all the mystical teachings of all the religions. That you are something more than the sum total of your thinking apparatus. And we should be aware of that. This is, and this is what you do in Centering Prayer. You get away from your thinking apparatus and the real you, now I know this sounds strange, but the real you is only then able to come forward. And the real you is simply a towards Godness. If you can think of that, well don't think of it be it. Uh, it's a toward Godness, a naked intent toward God. Absence of all memories, ideas, thoughts, words, images, and so forth. So uh, your mind should be empty, he says, but anchored in faith. Now, you will have a naked thought and a blind awareness of your own being, but no particular ideas. Well, it's, what he's trying to say uh, is, you will have a consciousness that you are. But again, like I say, is that you, you want an awareness that God is. Not God is great, God is Trinity, God is Father. No, just God is. And the same thing about yourself. You want to have an awareness that you are. Not that you are John Smith, or, or that you are tired, or that you are really trying to do something that you can't do, or uh, that you're anxious, or that you're looking for a job. None of that. You simply are. So there is God who simply is, and you who simply are. And the is are, that's being. And that's what it's all about. God's being and your being. And our very existence is a share in the very being of God. We are one with God. We are divine. Uh, You know, I get get kind of upset about this. Uh, About a year ago, some woman, um, she was connected with um, Mother Angelica, EWTN, and uh, she came out with a book called, I think it's uh, something like this, Father Thomas Keating versus St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, and and, and she, what she's taking issue is that Father Keating says, we are God, we are divine. And she, she calls this the rankest heresy. Well, it, it is not rank heresy, it is a fundamental truth of our faith. You know, um, when, the, when the priest says Mass, Before he offers the chalice of wine, he pours a few drops of water in it. And he says, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we become sharers in the divinity of Christ, even as he shares in our humanity. What does that mean? Sharers in the divinity of Christ. We become God. We become a ship. We're, we're not God by nature. We're God by grace, by God's grace. 
and by, by the death and resurrection of Christ. We are one with God. What does one with God mean? It means you're one with God. Uh, so uh, uh, it can't be any clearer than that. Um, so he, he, uh, the author that, that goes on to say, you will have a naked thought and a blind awareness of your own being but no particular ideas. And, and as ideas will come, you can't help it, we reject them. That's what Centering Prayer does, what he calls burying them beneath the cloud of forgetting. So, you will be aware that you are loving God in a general sort of way, even during your, 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 your Centering Prayer. Um, we must also apply to ourselves the author says, that simple general thought is this, God is as he is, and so I am as I am. In this way, he says, our thoughts will not be scattered or fragmented, but unified in God. We are one with God, not just in theory, but in our experience. This, by the way, is what the Hindus and the Buddhists refer to as non-duality. There are not two, God and us, God and me. No, there is just one. There is the unity of God and me. So, God is your being. Now, you are not God's being, but you, God is your being. You know, I say you are not because God is more than your being, you see. So, um, we are God, but God is not us. Uh, God is the cause and ground of our being. That's a favorite expression, you know, of my, my girlfriend. I, I like older women. <laughs> Julian is uh, 600 years old. <laughs> uh, it, it's a favorite expression of her. God is the ground of your being. That's why God is even, she says, God is the ground of your beseeching, the ground of your prayer. Uh, and, and that is why God answers prayer, must answer prayer. Thank you, dear. Uh, the, because he, he's the source of it. God is the ground of your being. So uh, there is a difference between us and God, and, and there always will be. For example, we did not make ourselves. Uh, that's, a, that's a difference. We did not exist from all eternity. Although, in a way, in a sense, we did, as you read the, the hymns of Colossians and Philippians and, and, and the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, uh, that we were in the beginning with God from, from, from all time. So you won't hear that preached on a Sunday morning, though. <laughs> um, so even with this difference, however, we must be aware that God is the ground of all being, and but in him all being is one. So there is a unified uh, oneness of being. Now, uh, so let, the author says, let grace um, unite your affections to God. Affections is just another word for love. Let grace unite your affections to God. Th that's really, really important. Every, that's the problem though, you know, with the cloud and with the Book of Privy Counseling. You can't just pass over a phrase, a word, or a sentence and think you know what it means. You really have to look, look into them because they're packed. Grace, the understanding of grace. And I, I do like to, to refer to the uh, description that Richard Rohr gives. Um, he says, grace is not something God has, and it's not something God gives. Grace is something God is. Uh, so uh, let grace uh, unite your affections to him. So let God unite your affections to him. And for your part, see, now that this is, God does the active positive 
loving activity. God does that. That's, that's his problem, not yours. He'll take care of it. But what do you do? What is your share in this? Your part is to reject all inquiries into your being or his. And that's what our thinking does. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. I'll, I mean, if it's wrong to do that, we'd have to fire all of our theologians. Uh, but it, 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 what, it's wrong to do it. It's not right to do it when we do our contemplative prayer. Because when we're doing that, we're not doing contemplative prayer. You see, we should do it at other times. Yeah, we should study the catechism, read the Bible, uh, you know, uh, listen to the teachings of, of theologians. Yes but not during the time of contemplative prayer. Uh, we reject all inquiries into your being or God's being, okay? So uh, rest in this naked, stark, elemental awareness. Uh, again, awareness, uh, in, intention, intentionality that's what it's all about those are the really really important words uh, in contemplative prayer all here's what Richard Rohr says all great spiritual teachers will tell you that your small self is not the reference point for anything lasting or substantial but it's your small self is only a reference point from a small memory bank of experiences and feelings and and a temporary self image all too small and not a fitting reference point for the big truth or for reality St. Paul would have called it illusion or even emptiness. Thomas Merton called it the, for, the false self. Ken Wilbur, if you're familiar with Ken Wilbur, uh, uh, he calls it your ego encapsulated skin. Uh, so that's, th this is what, what we're talking about. Now, um, until this autonomous self, this false self, is, and that's, that's the false self when you think you're nothing but your thoughts. And by the way, almost everybody thinks that way. Anyone who is not a contemplative thinks that way. They think that's the real self, this person who is thinking these thoughts. Well, I don't know what your thoughts are like, but some of mine, I just assume not described for you, and I'm very grateful that's not who I am. It's something that happens to me, you know, but it isn't who I am. So uh, uh, until this autonomous self is somehow dismantled um, as a worthy receiver station, because that the skin encapsulated ego is not a worthy receiver station, one cannot get very far in spiritual insights or spiritual seeing. You are too small at this point and the God you find will be made to fit inside of this smallness. We, we create a God who is as small and as false as we are. Uh, your own issues your personal hurts and your self-image will, on the other hand, be far too big, too exaggerated, and too grandiose, trying to overcompensate for such lack of perspective and substance. So you'll either be too big or too small, but in either case you'll be false or phony. Your feeling world will be all about you. This is all about me. You know it isn't. It isn't all about you. This is the cause of most of the evil in the world, thinking that it's all about me. 
uh, because it has no other center of gravity, your, your, your feeling world, and it has no other center of gravity except what you feel moment by moment and year by year, all of which Richard Raw says is nothing but shifting sand. There is much more to it. There is your being and there is God's being. Um, contemplation is an entirely new way of knowing the world and it has the power to move us beyond mere ideology and dualistic thinking. Thinking that I am actually separate from the rest of creation. I am not, nor is God. Uh, mature religion will always lead us to some form of prayer, meditation, contemplation, to balance out our daily calculating mind. Now, there's a combination here of Richard Rohr and the Book of Privy Counseling. Believe me, uh, Richard Rohr says, it is major surgery, and you must practice it for years to begin to rewire your egocentric responses. Ken Wilber says, a couple of years. <laughs> two, two, three years. Uh, contemplation is work. That's the cloud of unknowing calls it the work of love. So much so that most people give up after their first futile attempts. I think usually that's because of poor instruction. Uh, but the goal of contemplation is not success. What? The goal of contemplation is not success. What the goal is, the continuing practice of attempting to love God. There isn't anybody here who can't succeed in that. The continuing practice. You know, we say, you know, how is your contemplative meditation? Well, oh, it was awful, or oh, a monkey mind, or oh, oh all kinds of things. No, no. Did you do it? Yes. Well, I, I, I lasted the 20 minutes. Then it was a complete success. That's the only criterion for success is did you do it? Okay. So the only people who pray well are those who keep praying. That is to pray well, to persevere, to continue. The continued reconnection is the praying. It's not the occasional consolations that we're apt to give too much attention to. Um, it's take that as an absolute. The capacity for non-dual seeing, that is unity seeing, seeing yourself as one with God, that is developed through contemplation, allows us to be happy, rooted in God, Comfortable with paradox. In other words, seeming contradictions don't throw us because we're not depending on our mental capacity here. We're depending on our emotive, our loving capacity. Uh, and mystery. And largely immune to mass consciousness. Care what other people think, you see. And its false premises. Now, this is true wisdom knowing. Uh, and it is the job of elders, all of which you are. I, I won't ask you that, but how many people are here under 40? Very few, you're elders. Uh, it is the job of elders to pass it on to the next generation. And so we don't have to start each generation at zero. We don't require each generation to reinvent the wheel. Contemplation is meeting, and this is Richard Rohr again, contemplation is meeting as much reality as you can handle in its most simple 
an immediate form, without filters, without judgments, without commentaries. The ego does not trust this way of seeing, which is why it is so rare. Um, a narrow gate, Jesus says, and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The only way you can contemplate it is by recognizing and, and relativizing your own compulsive mental grids, your thinking apparatus, uh, your practiced ways of judging, critiquing, blocking, and computing everything. When your judgmental mind and all its commentaries are placed aside, or as the cloud says, are buried beneath the cloud of forgetting, God finally has a chance to get through to you. Because otherwise, you're in the way. God has a chance to get through to you because your pettiness and self-protective filters are at last out of the way. And then truth, capital T, stands revealed on its own. Now, in chapter 2, the, uh, the book of Privy Counseling, he goes on to say, the, um, while admittedly, um, the uh, Book of Privy Counseling is written for those who are somewhat advanced in the experience of contemplation. Um, at the same time, the author insists that this prayer is so utterly simple that even the most uneducated person accustomed to a very primitive type of life can easily find uh, uh, the way to real union with the su sweet simplicity of contemplative perfect love. I, I find it, that, that with children, you know, uh, the, the, the two easiest type of people to teach contemplative prayer, and I, I speak of years and years of experience, are children and elderly people. You know why? Because they don't do the yabbity. <laughs> they don't listen to you and say, yeah, but they just do it, you see. But you people here now, you're, you know, all of you people that are under 85, uh, uh, you're, you're, the, you're in the yabbit stage, you know. Be, be conscious of that. Um, the author of the, of the book of Privy Counseling says, um, that the, uh, uh, um, uh, I have a massive misprint here, I'll have to excuse that. But he says, even dumb animals, uh, even dumb animals are capable uh, of such self-awareness of their own self, you know, their own being. And they don't let thinking interfere with it because they don't know how to think. They don't really have that ego-encrusted uh, mind. So he says, go down, here's what the author says that now, go down to the deepest point of your mind. And if you prefer to the highest pinnacle of your mind. That, that he says that in the cloud too. He says, I don't care whether you think of, you know, he talks about the prayer word, going from your heart up into God, up in the cloud of unknowing, or going down into the very depths of your being, to that still point of your being. The lowest point or the pinnacle, the highest point, doesn't matter. Uh, and, and, and do not think what you are, but that you are. See, he calls it a simple awareness of your own being and, and, and a naked intent stretching out to God's being. So, and he says, don't think 
about what you are. This involves a lot of, now, he, by the way, he always says, at other times you should do this, all right? You should think about yourself and, and think about the scriptures and think about teachings of theologians and, and so forth, but not during the time of your contemplative meditation. Do not think about what you are. This involves, thinking about what you are, involves a lot of thought and introspection and you have already been doing this uh, in a purgative way. Uh, you have humility, which is a knowledge of the truth about yourself. And you are also aware of your own sins. This is part of your spiritual journey that you're doing outside your moments of contemplative prayer, okay? Knowing the truth, learning the truth about yourself, a consciousness of your own inadequacies and so forth. So, but now he says, forget about all this stuff. And, and, and I, I, I love that in the in cloud, he's repeating what he says in the cloud. Uh, you, you want to, you want to be a contemplative, you want to begin this serious work of love, this journey to union with God. He says, all right, get right with you, with God. You know, go to confession or be sorry for your sins and then forget about them. I love that. It, 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 one of the things that he absolutely will not tolerate is scrupulosity. Uh, he says, forget about this stuff. And his, do you know that song? There's a song in Camelot. Uh, it's called Fie on Goodness, Fie. Well, he says, he actually says he, in the Book of Privy Counseling, Fie on Sin. Uh, forget them. And you know, we make such a fuss about sin, and God does not. God does not. And, and you know, God says to Julian of Norwich, and I also wrote recently reading it on last Saturday, the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena, in her dialogues. Uh, God says, look, uh, sin doesn't bother me. Can you imagine what it would be like for God if sin bothered him? <laughs> billions, billions of times, every hour since the beginning of the world. He says, I, I'm perfect. Nothing bothers me. I, I simply love. I love you before you sin. I love you while you are sinning. I love you after you have sinned. Uh, so he says, just forget about that. Fie on sin. Um, um, forgive yourself your sins. Don't be contaminated, contaminated by them. Uh, just focus on your ability to know that you are and that I am. The burden of your sins may still weigh upon you, but this is what you are to do. And I quote, he says, take the good, gracious God, just as he is, as plain as a common poultice. Take God with a glass of water and an aspirin, you see. And look, uh, 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 lay him on to your sick self just as you are. Reach out and touch, just as he is, even as the woman in the gospel touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Let your desire, again it's desire, awareness, intentionality, let your desire Let your desire be to reach out and touch the very being of God. Because you know what that is, it's actually God is reaching out and touching the very center of your soul. Uh, so leave behind, again, speculation and inquiry and offer to God the blind awareness of your naked being. 
in joyful love. This is your role in the contemplative experience. Then God will perform his role is to bind you and make you spiritually one with his own precious being. So that's what we call synergy, huh? the work of God and your work. Right, that's chapter two. In chapter three, I'm, I'm just gonna go through some of this. I don't, I'm certainly not going to finish all the 23 chapters, but uh, I, I do hope to uh, uh, maybe appeal to you and, and, and you will continue to do this on your own. Read the book of Privy Counseling. But in chapter three, he says, when you begin your practice of centering prayer, your undisciplined faculties, now by that he means your memory, your imagination, your will, uh, you don't give them any meat to feed on. That's because you're burying it, okay, beneath the cloud of forgetting. So, um, and, and, and what you're doing is you're recommending to, to these faculties that they take up something more worthwhile uh, for them. Or rather, your faculties are calling on you, telling you to take up something more worthwhile for, for them, and by that they mean something less than God. So in a way it says it sounds like you're fighting yourself, but you aren't really fighting yourself because you are not your faculties. You are not your thoughts, you are not your memories, you are not your imagination. Those are things you have and things that you do, they are not who you are. You are something much greater than them. So remember that, they are the, you know, the skin encapsulated ego uh, of your false self. So their dissatisfaction, the author uh, of Privy Counseling says, this is a good sign because it proves that you have gone on to something of greater value than they are. When you have difficulty in your centering prayer, it's a good sign because the difficulty is caused by your faculties who are clamoring for your attention and to feed them with insignificant nothings. Uh, and that's a good sign uh, that, that they're protesting by uh, the fact that you're leaving them behind and you're going on to something greater than your false self. So uh, the, uh, a naked, quiet awareness of your blind being uh, and your joyful gift of it to God can bring you closer to God than all the activities of all your mental faculties. So don't worry, he says. And this is what discourages most people, by the way. Don't worry if they plague you to give it up. They had their place, uh, and they still do on occasion, but in comparison to this blind awareness of your being and your gift of self to God, they are useless. So he says, go be, notice, by the way, and this is what all the great mystics and any good teacher does, repeat, 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 and then repeat what you're repeating. Uh, so go beyond your intellect and worship God with your very being in simple wholeness. Now there are times when you do worship God with your intellect, I'm not, saying, you know, that, that we don't do that. Of course we do. But again, we're talking about the time of contemplative meditation. Um, uh, so go beyond your intellect and worship God with your very self in simple wholeness, all that you are and just as you are. Do not scatter your attention. Um, by way of this loving attention to God, you nourish and foster not only yourselves, but the entire human race. Well, that is so very, very important. This is why Richard Rohr, he has the, you know, the Center for Contemplation and Action. And that, that, that 
contemplative prayer is not simply navel gazing. It is gazing into the heart of God. But then, uh, you know, you, you, something, has, something comes of it. And if you look at the people in the world who have been most efficacious and most beneficial, uh, you know, to the world, you're going to find, by and large, they, these are people on the leading edge of contemplation. I think of Mother Teresa, for example. So, um, you nourish and foster not only yourself, but the entire human race. And that's also because of the, uh, the oneness, the unity that you have with God, you therefore have a oneness and unity with everything and everyone else that God has a oneness and unity with. Two things united to a third thing are united to each other. So uh, by this union with God, we are united to the entire cosmos. Uh, this is a Buddhist teaching too, by the way. And I love the way they say it sometimes. A Buddhist will say, you know, a butterfly that flitters on the branch of a tree in a forest in the Ukraine has an influence on a supernova in the furthest galaxy of the universe. Well, what is it? What does that mean? Well, I have a hangnail in my little finger. Is it my little finger that is pain, suffering? Or is it me, William, that's suffering? Well, clearly, it's me. See? And the same thing. Something you do, as insignificant as you are, is something that affects the entire cosmos. This is what Buddhists call karma. And it's a very true, it's a very real thing. Uh, so, the... Um, Let me repeat that again because I think this, you know, you want to be uh, 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 conscious of this and, and even expectant of it. By way of this loving attention to God, namely contemplative prayer, you nourish and foster not only yourselves, but the entire human race. I, I really uh, count on that and stress that because uh, my, in my Trappist monasteries, we're a contemplative order. We have no other reason for existence. Oh, oh, I make flower cards. <laughs> it doesn't justify my existence. <laughs> Although when you see them, you may think it does. <laughs> uh, but the, the um, uh, and I remember when I, you know, I was a parish priest, uh, very active. I was very successful in the diocese. And I held a number of significant posts and whatnot. And then I decided to become a Trappist. And I remember telling my mother, my mother, Irish woman, born in Britain. And uh, so I say, Mama, I'm going to become a Trappist. And she said, oh, that's nice, dear. And, and, and what will you do? Well, she was thinking, you know, I'll be a missionary. I'll work in a, I'll teach in a college. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll whatever, feed the poor and stuff like that. <laughs> I only answered. I said, Mom, we don't do anything. <laughs> We really don't. Uh, we raise cattle for a living because the, the rule obliges us to earn our living through manual labor. So we raise cattle. We also we were also chipmunks. You know, we cook chocolate chip cookies. Uh, and and uh, you know, but those things are not important. The important thing is, and why we do those things is so that we can lead a life of prayer. And even sharing it as I am with you now, this is by way of rare exception. Uh, I'm the only one in the community who does it. And, and I do it because the abbot feels that he, he does want somebody, you know, in some way uh, uh, sharing actively what goes on in the monastery itself. See? So, but uh, uh, we do benefit, and you do it also. It, it, you, you, in chapter three of The Cloud of Unknowing, he says that this work is, is more pleasing to God than anything else you could do. And the reason for that is, he says that is because you are united to God, you are there in love, you are therefore united in love to everyone God is united to in love. And that excludes no one. Uh, 
that that is and should be a characteristic, by the way, of the, the the Catholic Church and every other Christian church should be excluding no one. It should be inclusivity, not exclusivity. So uh, he says, even if you were uh, actu if you actually consider all of your noblest faculties and qualities, you would come at length to the ultimate frontiers of thought and find yourselves face to face with naked being itself. And we can express this, and he gives a, a prayer uh, that expresses it. He says, we can express this in, the, in this prayer. That which I am and the way that I am with all my gifts of nature and grace, you have given to me, O Lord, and you are all of this. I offer it back to you, principally to praise you and to help my fellow men and women and myself. So, your naked being is the very first gift that God has given you. So forget thinking about it, but let the blind general awareness of it bring you and all humankind closer to God. It makes a big difference, by the way, if you're aware of that. When you sit down to do your 20 minutes of centering prayer, be conscious of this. That, that what you are doing benefits all of creation. That sounds megalomaniac, isn't it? But, but it's not. It's, it's simply the nobility of, 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 of an intelligent creature of God uh, and the power that, that God gives us. So, uh, now, again, I want to refer to Richard Rohr here. Uh, he, uh, he refers to the, what he calls the first half of life as the time we spent doing our survival dance. Uh, first half of life, uh, you know, first 30 years, whatever, it's all about me, all about me, and, and getting ahead of everyone else, you know, leading the race, and so forth. And, and then, but then he says the second half of life then becomes our sacred dance. Uh, when, when, we get, when we get the survival, we get over that. Uh, and then we do the sacred dance. Most of us never get beyond our survival dance. Um, and and uh, concern, the, uh, the uh, deep concerns of the soul. We're too busy saving our souls, whatever that means, to do the sacred dance. Money, status, group identity, and security, um, and all the rest of that. Um, he says, leave them behind and worship God with your substance. And what does he mean by your substance? That which you truly are, not this superficial ego, you, the, your false self, whom we oftentimes think that's who we are, but that's not your substance. So uh, in this way, you will bind everything together and in a wonderful way help all of humanity. Because of this life in God, who is the ground of your being, you will be filled with an abundance of love and practical goodness. Uh, see, that, that's the two loves. When Jesus was asked, what was the great commandment? He says, well, love God, you know, the whole heart and soul. But he couldn't stop there. He had to come up with the second one. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, the, the, the two are inseparable. Uh, usually they use the, the Latin word uh, amor, which is love of God. And there's another word for love, caritas, which is love of neighbor. Uh, which is what Richard Rohr means here when he says practical goodness. So... Grace will work in you. Now, grace is simply God, the reality of God. 
Grace will work in you joyously and effortlessly. You will no longer need the toil of discursive meditation, thinking, thoughts, okay? The angels will bring you knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So, um, <coughs> By offering to God, then, um, this blind awareness of your own being, you are enriched with a loving, delicate, spiritual knowledge beyond all natural understanding of your faculties. And this is what is meant by wisdom. Um, wisdom is the ability to perceive reality through the eyes of God. Uh, um, um, Meister Eckhart has a saying that expresses the same thing in a, in a beautiful, mysterious way. He says, the eye with which you see God is the same eye with which God sees you. Uh, th that's what is meant by that. It's, it's a delicate spiritual knowledge beyond all natural understanding of your faculties. True wisdom. Now he says, this wisdom spontaneously bursts from the deepest inner ground of your soul. Now you may say, well, now wait a minute. I did 20 minutes of centering prayer this afternoon and nothing burst from the deepest inner ground of my soul. When I'm saying, now you wait a minute, it did. It's not a matter of consolation. It's a matter of faith, knowing the reality of the true self that you're experiencing. So then he says, uh, the author of the cloud says a very, uh, of the Privy Council says a very strange thing. He says, um, this is a dark and formless wisdom. You know, they, they made the, the, the newspapers made a great hype of this when they discovered this, these letters in this diary of Mother, Mother Teresa and found out, you know, for years she went through the, these really traumatic spiritual trials. It, 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 anyone who knows any spiritual theology or understanding was looking for this. Uh, it, it had to be there because every saint, and, and, and you and I are saints, by the way, Every saint in his own way has to go through it. So um, uh, it is rooted in, in this, this dark and formless wisdom, um, is rooted and grounded in charity, which is the perfection of the whole law. Jesus was asked, you know, what is the law? And he said, it's love God and love your neighbor. Uh, so in this law, you are observing, observing as a whole all of the commandments of Christ. Um, as a, in chapter 7, we're moving on now because he just repeats something in the other chapters that, that, that I'm, I'm passing over. Chapter 7, he says, um, through experience, this interior work of contemplation will become a spiritual habit. Anybody who's been doing this for several years or more. And, and it's important though to try, this is why we say, you know, outside of the contemplative moments themselves, we do exercise our faculties. That's what you're doing now. You know, you're listening to me, try, trying to understand the stuff that I'm coming up with, okay? Uh, so, um, and, and this is what helps it become a spiritual habit, this idea, this understanding of this experience. Um, this is what I call the contemplative attitude. So what the contemplative attitude actually is, and this is stressed in the book of Privy Counseling, it's an overflow of the actual time of meditation that you do so that begins to permeate more and more and capture your entire day. 
And usually this is a very, very subtle thing, and you're not really aware that it is happening. Although on occasionally, you might say, or you know, you might be aware, well, how close you are, or you feel to God, or how often God comes to your mind in your service of God, and your love of God. Occasionally you might, you know, be conscious of that and recognize it wasn't always that way in your earlier life, but, but that's how it is now. So it is a very secret, a very mysterious, a very mystic, and a very subtle reality, but it does happen. Um, see, when, when, when the, uh, this is when the time of your contemplative meditation begins to spill out into your daily life. Uh, and this is, a, this is why I, I want to try to communicate an awareness of that to people who have been meditating, you know, for a long period of time. Be conscious of this. Uh, reality. You will begin more and more, the author says, to see the true reality of yourself and the world around you. You will recognize and reject the world, the flesh, and the devil, which draws you away both from your real self and from God. Now, uh, here the author uh, of Privy Council becomes very practical as well as truly spiritual. He says, because of grace, namely the presence of God, because of grace and the light of wisdom, which is the ability to see reality through the eyes of God as it truly is, because of grace and the light of wisdom that you receive from persevering in contemplative prayer uh, in so far as you can. He then goes on to say something very important happens. He says this simple loving work is now it's is not a rival to your daily activities. The ordinariness of your life will always be the ordinariness of your life, but with a difference. Uh, and he's actually here, for those of you, you know, familiar enough with the cloud, he's referring to chapter 54 of the cloud, where he talks about the fruits of contemplation. But he says, uh, it's not a rival to your daily life. It's not going to interfere with it. You're not going to be spaced out, you know, so that you can't hold a job. Uh, he says, but with your attention centered on the blind awareness of your naked being, united to God's naked being. Now, listen, this is a direct quote from the Book of Privy Counseling. You will go about your daily rounds, eating and drinking, sleeping and waiting, going and coming, speaking and listening, lying down and rising up, standing and kneeling, running and writing, working and resting. So he covers all the things. Now today he would put in checking your email, watching TV, <laughs> texting on your cell phone. Um, so, and, and he says, uh, in the midst of all of this, you will be offering God continually each day the most precious gift you can make and this will be at the heart of everything you do, whether active or contemplative. I remind you that it is only by the mercy of Jesus in your, and your own loving consent that you may hope to obtain this. Now, what, what he describes, the, you know, uh, somebody gets up in the morning, and, uh, you know, this is 14th century, so he goes out to the well and he brings in a bucket of water and he puts it over in the, in the fireplace and 
he heats it up and he makes a cup of tea, and then he gets a piece of uh, you know uh, uh, black bread from the from the the, the 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 bread box and and dips that in his tea and has his breakfast, and then uh, maybe he'll take a, a, a he go out to take a shower. Now they didn't take showers too often, uh, but you know he'll he'll feed, go out and feed the animals and and uh, milk the cow. And then he'll go and get the plow to go out in the field and work in the plow. And at noontime, he'll stop and he'll take out his big sweet onion and his black bread and, and have his lunch. And then he'll work until sunset. Then he'll come in, uh, wash up, maybe sit in front of his cottage looking at the sunset a little bit, go in and have supper, say his prayers and go to bed. That is a saint. That is the activity of a saint. That is a contemplative. That is someone whom the contemplative attitude has reached out from his uh, 20 minutes a day or whatever of contemplative prayer and is now permeating his whole prayer. It's not a rival or a threat to his daily activities, but rather what it does is it illuminates them. It fills them. It turns them into something extraordinarily loving, peaceful, wise, and holy. So. Uh, this is what should be happening. This is what is happening uh, to people who persevere in their contemplative experience. So he says, uh, you must be aware that there is that, uh, namely the world, the flesh, and the devil, which will try to uh, drag you down from the heights of this valuable work. You know this from your experience, and it will continue to happen. But the Lord is at your side and will never cease to defend and protect you. Now, uh, in, a, in chapter 8, I'm going to close with chapter 8. And I think it's, the, uh, it's the, one of the most beautiful chapters in the book of Privy Counseling. And it's kind of an examination of conscience in reverse. It's not an examination of conscience by saying, oh, well, let me see what my sins are. Remember what he, all, he says about sin? Fie on it. Uh, so, uh, but I, instead of being an examination and listing of faults and imperfections, it's rather a list of virtues of good intentions and loving activities. So, the author begins with a rhetorical question about finding a holy person. Actually meaning that he has found this person in the reader who was given to contemplation. So he asks, where shall we find a person so wholeheartedly committed and firmly rooted in the faith, so sincerely gentle and true, having made self as it were nothing, so that's humility, and so delightfully nourished and guided by our Lord's love. Where will we find such a person? Where will we find, he says, a loving person, rich with a transcendent experience, an understanding of the Lord's power, of the Lord's unfathomable wisdom and radiant goodness. Notice here, by the way, when he talks about power, wisdom, and goodness, you have to know how to read the medieval authors. Uh, he's actually referring to the Trinity. Whenever they spoke of the power of God, they're referring to the Father. Whenever they spoke of the wisdom of God, they're referring to the Son. Whenever they spoke of the benevolence, the love, and the goodness of God, they're referring to the Holy Spirit. So, um, so uh, where can you find a loving person, see, manifesting the Trinity this way? The power, the wisdom, and the benevolence of God. Um, he says, where will I find one who understands so well the unity of God's essential presence in all things 
in the oneness of all things. And uh, so that he surrenders his entire being to God, in God, and by his grace, certain that unless he does, he will never be perfectly gentle and sincere in his efforts to make himself as nothing. Where is the man of sincerity to make himself as nothing? With high desire that God be all in the perfection of love. He deserves to experience, the, so he deserves to experience the, the mighty wisdom, in other words, God the Son, and the goodness of God, God the Holy Spirit succumbing, sheltering, and guiding him from his, uh, his, uh, his faults within and without. The, 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 we will find the Trinity active in our lives doing this. We will experience the power of God. We will experience the wisdom of God, and we will experience the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity is not an abstract doctrine. The Trinity is a verb, it's a living reality that manifests itself in our lives, and that is through contemplative prayer. He says, surely such a man will be deeply drenched in God's love and in the full and final loss of self as nothing. That is getting rid of the false self. And thus he will rest untroubled by a feverish activity, labor, and concern for his own physical well-being. Now, then he goes on to address himself rather strongly uh, to those who would make objections to contemplation. And he frequently goes back to that Martha and Mary event, you know, which he spends about five chapters on in the cloud of unknowing, where, where Martha complained to Jesus and asked to send her sister out to help her in the kitchen. And Jesus' response was, Martha, you're busy about many things, but Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken from her. She has chosen the one thing necessary. Well, there are no Marthas and no Marys. We're all combinations of the two. So, um, but he, he goes on, uh, rather strongly to make objections to those who object to contemplation. Oh, and we have them today. Um, uh, I, think, I think Frank just told me, uh, uh, if, I'm sure he doesn't mind if I share this, uh, how he, he was doing some work in prison, in a prison. And, and actually the chaplain stopped him and, he, and Frank wanted to teach them contemplative prayer, which by the way I've done in a dozen different prisons around the country. And the chaplain told him, unless you want to make soldiers of Christ out of these men, you have no place here. Well, that's incredible, you know? But we do, we do have that. That's, that's, that's prison. Um, there were many people in the day, at the time of the cloud of unknowing in the Book of Privy Counseling, and there are even more of them today. Um, and that includes bishops, clergy, and lay people who can never be led to understand it. Listen to what he says to them. Here's his response to them. Keep your human objections to yourself, you half-hearted folk. Be content with your own calling in the active life. It will bring you to salvation. But leave these others alone. What they do is beyond your comprehension. So do not be shocked or surprised by them. He then tells them that they should be ashamed of themselves because they constantly read or hear about contemplation in the scriptures and in the tradition and the fathers of the church without believing or accepting it. Oh, I've run across bishops who have forbidden me to teach contemplative prayer in their diocese. I don't want to make that too much, just two dioceses. He says, uh, you know, he's talking again to these people. He says, your own reason, your, your thinking apparatus, that's not going to bring you to God. So don't think you can depend on it. Only love is going to do that. Such people, he says, may be sincere 
and think they are furthering the Lord's plans, yet in the blindness of their inexperience, they destroy such plans. All right, well, that takes us up to chapter 9. So you can read that from there on yourself. <laughs> Thank you. questions. I think people have some questions. The, uh, what I want to say is since I turned off Father Heath's machine in the beginning, we did record all of this, but for my introduction about the first minute. So I just want to say for then posterity, this is Father William Menninger. Uh, we're here at St. John Newman, uh, May 4th, uh, 2017. And we're uh, being led in a teaching on the Book of Privy Counseling uh, from the, the extension of the Cloud of the Unknown. So, can I ask you the first question? Well, and let me first say also, hopefully, we'll have this put on YouTube, huh? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, Father, yeah. Father Heath and I, we'll, we'll talk. Yes, the first question. First question is, if, if we all practice, any one of us practice this kind of contemplative prayer, and we're faithful to it, will we be guaranteed, can you promise us, that at 85, we'll have the vigor and intellect that you have? <laughs> Unless you die at 79. <laughs> <laughs> next question, next question. Do we have any, any other questions? Go ahead, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm new to this, and I've done some reading about it, and it seemed as though the uh, emphasis was on having a word to bring you back if you get distracted, to bring you back, and Father, Anything about Let me that repeat the question for the, for, the, for, the, for the YouTube. The, the question is that, you know, when the uh, person has read a lot about this and contemplation, meditation, and it talks about having a word, a sacred word, Father Keating's, you know, teachings talk about a sacred word. And since we didn't talk about it tonight, can Father Manager speak to that? Yeah, the reason I didn't talk about it tonight is because it's, uh, it's very strong in the cloud of unknowing itself. In chapter 7, the last paragraph of The Cloud of Unknowing, the author says, If you wish, you may gather all your desire, your love, into one word. Choose, he says, a simple word, like a name of God, such as love or God. And let this word be constantly in your mind and in your heart and let it be the means to which you fight all your distractions and anything that would take you away from God. So there you clearly have what the Hindus call a mantra, no question about it, and what, what Father Keating calls it, I call a prayer word. Uh, it's very definitely there, yeah. Chapter seven, last paragraph. Any other questions? Yes. I just want to say I'm one of the people that have gotten very discouraged and I have a hard time keeping up with it. And a lot of what you said tonight um, is encouraging. Like you're you're praying for humanity. Um, that's a lot of encouragement for me. And I, I do have the cloud of unknowing and the book of privy counseling at home. And I'm encouraged to open it up. And Thank you for saying that, that it's, yeah. an, it's been encouraging to her. Because that's exactly the purpose and why I came here. And I'm really, I'm grateful to you for hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Over here. Uh, this may be an odd question, but um, occasionally my mind is blank. And I'll have um, a feeling, like a gust of wind or something. A feeling across me. And I feel a connection with God. Is that, in essence, the feeling of having that no intention connection with God? Oh, yeah, I hear. Uh, yes, that's what we're talking about. What is happening there, we call that transcending. You don't try for that. That's not a, a special thing that if you don't have it, you're not doing it right. But occasionally you will experience, actually, uh, this, this emptiness. Uh, which is filled with God, and, and you're not going to notice it. It's not going to be pouring out your nose, you know. 
but that is the reality. You are beyond yourself. You are over yourself. Yeah. And you're not depending on your thoughts, your images, your memories, or your ideas. And that is a simple uh, manifestation of it. Not an essential one or a necessary one, but it does happen, yes. It always feels very positive and it always feels kind of enveloped. Yes. It doesn't last long, but I do notice it. Though. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's what we call transcending. Okay, thank you very much. And, and you, you, I just wanted to notice that, do you notice, Father Manager, that if you meet someone, it is always true, if you meet someone who's enlightened, the degree to which they are enlightened by the degree to which they are inviting and welcoming. You know, we talked about when you're connected to God, you're connected then through God's love to everyone and no exceptions. And you can just feel that. I just want you to experience. We're talking about a direct union and experience with love. That's what we're having. And so thank you for being here so we can have that experience. Thank, thank you very you. much.